All right. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's session, Boost Your LLM with Private Data Using Llama Index. I'm Emily Kersey, and I am a member of the team here at Zillas. I'll cover a few housekeeping items, and then we'll get right into the session. First, this webinar is being recorded, so if you have to drop off at any point, you will get access to the on-demand version within a couple of days. If you have any questions, feel free to paste them into the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen or into the chat window on the right hand side of your screen. Um, be sure to check out Zillas.com for upcoming events. Um, be sure to join us on the middle of the Slack workspace and uh, check out some of our free resources. I will drop some links to those in the chat in just a few moments. And today I'm pleased to introduce today's session, Boost Your LLM with Private Data Using Llama Index and our guest speaker, Jerry Liu. For those who don't already know, Jerry is the co-founder and CEO of Llama Index, an open source tool that provides a central data management and query interface for your LLM application. Before this, he spent his career at the intersection of ML, research, and startups. He led the ML monitoring team at Robust Intelligence, did self-driving AI research at Uber ATG, and worked on recommendation systems at Quora. He graduated from Princeton in 2017 with a degree in CS. In addition to Jerry, a little later in the session, we'll also be joined by my colleague, Frank Liu, an ML architect and our director of ops here at Zillas. With that, uh, Jerry, I will let you take it away. Awesome. Thanks so much, Emily. And as Emily said, uh, I'll be doing a short presentation and then afterwards I'll have uh, a nice chat with Frank. And so, uh, sweet. So Llama Index is a central interface between large language models and your external data. Uh, it exists as a GitHub pro uh, as a GitHub open source project. Uh, we have an ecosystem of uh, different projects within uh, the Llama Index uh, organization. But uh, today we'll mostly talk about the core repo uh, and and the toolkits that it offers. So the context here is that large language models are a phenomenal piece of technology for knowledge generation and reasoning. Uh, they're pre-trained on large amounts of just you know publicly available data and they can be used for a variety of different types of use cases uh, for instance like being able to answer questions being able to generate arbitrary amounts of text being able to summarize text and also being able to plan different types of actions i think anybody building uh, llm applications uh, or building trying to build applications on top of this amazing technology ask themselves how do we best augment uh, llms with our own private data uh, so if whether you're kind of like a single person and you have a bunch of files lying around on your hard drive or, you know, you're an enterprise user and you have a ton of workplace applications like Notion, Slack, Salesforce, or, you know, you are uh, using an enterprise data lake and you just have a variety of different types of databases that, you're, you're, um, that, that store different types of data, how do you augment language models with this data that's stored in these different sources? There's a few paradigms these days for adding knowledge uh, into a, a language model. Uh, and so one of the first paradigms is this idea of fine tuning, which is more along the lines of classical machine learning, where you can you know, add new knowledge by just retraining the network to incorporate this new knowledge. Uh, and so there's a variety of different types of you know, training algorithms, techniques, processes that you can do. But fundamentally, it just boils down to some optimization process over the weights of the network uh, so that you train this network on, you know, some new private data. There's a few downsides today, at least, and, you know, fine tuning uh, has a lot of potential to get uh, very good uh, very soon. But today, there's a high amount of data preparation effort needed. Um, there's a certain lack of transparency uh, by actually being able to train on top of this data. Uh, you kind of trust that the network will internalize this knowledge uh, within, you know, uh, the, the numbers, basically. Uh, and then it doesn't actually work well for a variety of cases, and it's pretty expensive. The other approach to these days is this idea of in-context learning, where you actually put context into the prompt. Uh, and um, many of you might already be, be familiar with this paradigm, but the idea is that you take a pre-trained model. So for instance, like a pre-trained chat GPT or GPT-4, and then you can uh, take a corpus of external knowledge, for instance, like a set of essays or a set of texts or anything that you want, really. And then you pair the language model with some sort of retrieval model uh, to give you back the results that you want. So given a corpus of knowledge, let's say here, you would perform retrieval first um, in order to inject the relevant context into the input prompt itself. And then the input prompt would look something like, here's the context, insert context, given the context, answer the question, here's the question, 
and then and then you send the entire thing to the language model. So there's some general challenges of how do you do in context learning well? How do you combine retrieval uh, uh, and and generation in a way that that makes sense and gives good results? Another term for this these days is like retrieval augmented generation. Um, and how do you, uh, for instance, like do retrieval? How do you actually retrieve the right context for the prompt? Um, how do you deal with long context? How do you deal with source data that's potentially very large? So Llama Index is a toolkit that aims to solve that. And it is uh, its core mission is to solve that interface between your private data and your uh, language model. Our goal is to make this interface uh, fast, cheap, efficient, and performant. And I would say, you know, we've made some strides towards all these dimensions, but definitely it's an area of just continued improvement and growth. So we contain um, of uh, three main components within the core project. The first is this idea of data connectors uh, offered through our community-driven site called Lava Hub. Here, you can actually connect your existing data sources and data formats, for instance, like APIs, PDFs, documents, SQL, et cetera. And you can basically ingest all this data in a format that you can use uh, with the language model. And so uh, Llama Hub right now contains over 90 different uh, data connectors. We'll talk about it in just a bit, but it's a pretty easy to use tool for just like loading in a bunch of data. The next part, which really gets to the core of uh, the, the, the repo, is um, data indices. And data indices are essentially data structures that structure your data for different types of use cases. So if you imagine that your raw data is stored somewhere, for instance, in uh, object storage or in a vector database, um, indices are essentially lightweight views on top of this data uh, that allow you to define, um, for instance, like keyword lookup or embedding-based lookup. Um, and the idea is that every new index you define will kind of induce a different mode of retrieval and synthesis. And every index will be optimized for different uh, use cases. And then finally, the last part is this idea of like a query interface, where uh, once you've uh, ingested and structured your data, uh, you can now uh, wrap this within an overall query interface where you feed in some input prompt and then you get back uh, a knowledge augmented output. So another way of looking at Llama Index really is as this kind of black box uh, where you can uh, basically see it as a data interface for LM application development. And so uh, the input would be some rich query description uh, of the tasks that you want to have. Uh, and then the output is a rich response with references, uh, actions, et cetera. And under the Llama Index would manage the interactions between your language model uh, as well as your private data. Uh, to give you back the results that you want. The first part here is, um, let's talk a little bit about some of these components uh, more in depth. So data connectors uh, are powered by uh, Llama Hub, which uh, we mentioned is this like community-driven site of, of different types of data loaders. And this basically allows you to ingest any kind of data from anywhere into unified document containers. Um, the there it's uh, there, there's a lot of different data connectors within this hub, uh, and so this uh, this number is actually a little bit out of date. Uh, it's uh, we're at like 90 different loaders and counting now. So we have, for instance, like a, a ton of PDF parsers, web page readers, uh, doc like different types of scrapers, and um, like being able to load from different APIs, etc. And we also have growing support for multimodal documents, for instance, with images. Next, let's talk a little bit about the data indices and the query interface. So the data indices help to abstract away common boilerplate and pain points for in-context learning. Uh, and so uh, we, um, for instance, like they help to allow you to store context in an easy to access format for prompt insertion. Um, they allow you to deal with different types of prompt limitations, like 4,000 tokens for uh, DaVinci uh, when the context is too big. And they also helped you to deal with like text splitting. Again, the idea is that the index itself is kind of, you can almost see it as like metadata on top of your raw data. And each index will, uh, again, uh, have a different view of the data and create a different mode of retrieval. And we'll walk through a few examples of different indices just to show you uh, what, we're what we're thinking about. And the key idea is to give users the tools to, again, perform retrieval and synthesis uh, over your data and manage those interactions uh, in a way that uh, is very powerful. 
Finally, um, the next part is the query interface, uh, again, on top of these indices that can, uh, again, take in this input and give you back the output that you would want. So as an example over here, um, uh, if you look at the code image, um, the fundamental idea, the interface that's exposed to the end user is that you can just take in a query engine, uh, either from an index or something that you could define yourself, and then you could ask a question, and then you could give back a response that you would want. So the first index example uh, is is idea of like uh, a vector store index, uh, and and this is something that is becoming more and more popular uh, these days. This overall uh, kind of mode of retrieval and synthesis, uh, and I'm um, I'm uh, I just want to show you how this basically works, right? And this is something that offers a very nice integration point with Milvis and Zillis as well. So. The, the vector store index is basically this idea of pairing a vector store with the language model. And the way this works is that um, in the beginning, uh, you would have a set of source documents, for instance, like Notion documents, PDFs, and then you would perform data ingestion. And you would perform data ingestion, and, and the, these documents would uh, get ingested um, into, um, or, or sorry, uh, you would take in these source documents, you would split them up, split them up into text chunks using some sort of text splitting technique. And then you would uh, split them up into nodes, basically. A uh, node is basically a text chunk. And so each node would be stored in the vector store uh, with an embedding attached to it. Uh, so this is becoming you know, more and more popular these days. Uh, the vector store will essentially store a set of documents, uh, each document with an embedding. And then during query time, you would have this query. Um, you would take in uh, uh, so you would take in this query. You would take in an embedding model, and then you would embed this query. Um, you would use this query embedding to perform top k lookup from the vector store uh, to retrieve the most similar nodes. Um, and you know, there's like different query interfaces that this can expose to. Like you could do uh, raw semantic search. You can do hybrid search. You can do a variety of different types, like add metadata filters, etc. The idea is you retrieve a set of nodes from the vector store. And then you take the query, and then you feed this basically uh, into the response synthesis module along with the set of retrieve nodes. So um, going back really quick, we'll talk about response synthesis in just a little bit. But again, the high level idea is that you have retrieval and then you have synthesis. So retrieval uh, comes by you know looking up the relevant nodes from the vector store, and then synthesis comes by taking in the set of nodes pairing it with a query, and then being able to generate a response. Another basic example of an index structure that we have, and we have more, but this is just a very basic example, is this idea of like a list index, where you know you, you take in some um, uh, a set of uh, documents, you chunk it up, and you can choose to basically store some any set of nodes as like a flat list. So instead of necessarily indexing it with uh, embeddings for top k lookup, you can just store it, you know, um, as a, a linear list of nodes with like previous next relationships. So, for instance, like node two comes before node three, node two comes after node one. And this is a very simple data structure. Uh, but uh, the basically during query time, you can just take in this entire set of nodes from the list, and you can optionally choose to add filters if you want, uh, and then you combine it with a query and put it into the response synthesis module. So it, it's interesting because um, the idea here is that this uh, idea of like a list index basically allows you to perform summarization queries. Uh, whereas, um, for instance, with like by default vector store based lookup, you'd fetch like the top k most similar nodes from your knowledge corpus. This allows you to basically feed in all context from any document or any large subset of documents. Uh, into um, uh, some the response synthesis module to allow you to, for instance, like summarize large chunks of text. We can also talk a little bit about how response synthesis works once you actually have a retrieval model. Um, and so for, there's a few strategies for just like taking in a bunch of different texts and then being able to create a response, even if the set of text is greater than the context length of the language model. Um, one strategy here is create and refine. So we would start with the first node, we take in the query, and we would generate an initial response using a very similar prompt as what I showed in the beginning, which is here's some context, here's the, and then you, you put in the context from the node, and then given this context, answer the question. 
The difference is that if you have a set of nodes, you could take in the previous response from the previous node. So you take in this intermediate response, you take in the new context from node two, and you take in the query again, and then you pass it back into the language model and you ask it, uh, hey, like we have an initial response from the previous node. We have this new context. We have this existing question. Can you actually refine the existing answer to give me back potentially a better answer? And then you would iterate through every node within this list until you get back a final response. Another approach here, so this, this approach is sequential, and then this approach does things a bit more in parallel, is you just take in each node, and then for each node, you uh, get an initial response from it. So given this node, uh, given this query, give me back an initial answer. And then once you have an answer for each node, you can hierarchically combine each node into a set of parent answers and continue doing that until you get a final response. We call this uh, tree summarization. The idea is that you can just hierarchically build a tree of answers almost until you get to one root node, and then that root node is your final answer. So this tends to be a bit faster because you can parallelize it via async. This approach tends to have a bit more detail when you actually iterate through each node sequentially. But in the end, this is uh, up to empirical experimentation. Uh, just different types, uh, just playing around with different techniques. So we just there, there's other types of indexes too. Um, there's other types of uh, kind of integrations that we have. One key integration that we want to highlight is uh, integration with Milvis. So you can actually use integration uh, Milvis as a backend store uh, for both your text as well as embeddings. Uh, and the way you get set up is actually pretty simple. You just define like a Milvis vector store with all the parameters that you would want to have, um, wrap it in some storage context, and then put it into the vector store index. Then when you actually want to query, uh, you know, this, this index, you can just say uh, query engine equals index dot as query engine, and the response equals query engine dot query. And this will, uh, you know, query this index that's backed by, by Milvis, and then allow you to answer any types of questions that you would have. So uh, we can walk through a few examples uh, of how you actually, you know, uh, run Llama index. Uh, and so this is just a demo walkthrough uh, that allows you to uh, ingest data from Llama Hub, uh, build an index over it, and then query that as well. Um, and so I'm going to leave this uh, for now. Uh, I'll share the slides. And then if we have time, a little bit of time, maybe towards the end of this presentation, I'll quickly walk through the examples. I do, however, want to discuss some of the main use cases of Llama Index. Uh, and so from everything that we've described, um, the entire goal of Llama Index is really to orient uh, ourselves towards being a really good interface um, to allow you to answer basically any types of queries over your data um, with a language model. And so the idea here is that imagine talking to ChatGPT, you ask it a question, you get back a response. How can you basically maintain that exact same experience except now this uh, you know, ChatGPT, whatever language model you're using, has visibility into the overall data. So the, um, the um, a set of queries that you might ask over your data, whether it's just like a simple question or it's an actual task that you want to ask the language model, they can, you know, they can vary. Uh, and so we'll walk through a few of these examples uh, of different use cases of like uh, queries that you can run over your data using Llama Index. So the first use case is uh, we, we've already basically been over. It's this idea of just semantic search, right? And so you can you can define a vector store index over your data. So you import you know GPT vector store index. You could wrap it with a Milvis vector store, and then you load in a set of documents. Then um, you can define a query engine uh, on top of this index, and then you can ask a question like, could you give me a summary of this article or um, Oh, interesting. I think this uh, question needs to be updated. Um, basically, this question should be, uh, can you, uh, for instance, like what did the author do uh, during his time in college? Uh, and so if you just pretend this question actually really just represents something that uh, is more about specific facts in your knowledge corpus, that's the case where semantic search uh, does well. And so, yeah, this answer is supposed to answer the question, you know, what did the author do growing up during his time, uh, you know, and so, uh, the answer would be the author grew up writing short stories, programming on IBM 1401. 
the idea here is that you would take in this question and this question would reference specific facts that can actually be retrieved in your knowledge corpus. And then you would retrieve the knowledge corpus, uh, the, the, the documents from your knowledge corpus and use that to generate an answer. And that's the case where semantic search does well, because it allows you to do kind of like a relevant search or top cable lookup, really retrieve the relevant chunks of text. There are other use cases for a llama index though, right? And another use case is this idea of just summarization. How do you, you know, not just retrieve the relevant pieces of the text from a knowledge corpus, but how do you just like summarize the entire article? Um, and so for instance, if you use the list index, which uh, just as a refresher, you just store an entire list of nodes and then during query time by default, you would retrieve all the nodes and dump it into response synthesis. You can ask something like, could you give me a summary of this article in new line separated bullet points? And this would basically dump, uh, take in all the nodes corresponding to this article, however long it is, uh, uh, add it to the response synthesis module, which will abstract away the complexity of dealing with like prompt limitations and give you back a final answer. Like the author began writing and programming before college, uh, studied philosophy, you know, and then just give you an entire biography of the author. Another use case, and so far we've been talking primarily about unstructured data, is that we also offer uh, text to SQL support over structured data. So we have, for instance, like an index defined over unstructured data, and we also have an index defined over uh, structured data as well. And this is within, you know, um, kind of our, our SQL index, and it really consists of two main components. One is uh, conversion from unstructured data into structured data points. So on the data injection side, you can actually ingest unstructured documents and load it into a database. The second part is once you actually have structured data within a database, we offer a pretty uh, good text to SQL uh, interface over this data. So you can do default text to SQL, which will just take in the table schemas and uh, we can use the LLM to infer SQL statements from the uh, natural language query. We also offer additions on top. For instance, you could add uh, text annotations or context on top of the tables. You can actually store the table schemas themselves in an index um, so to deal with large uh, kind of like large amounts of table volumes uh, in case you're worried about, you know, the table schema not actually fitting in the prompt. Another example here is this idea of like synthesizing over heterogeneous data. So this actually gets into some of the graph structures that you can define with llama index. Um, so for instance, here, um, you can define, for instance, a vector index over your notion documents, and you could define a vector index over your Slack documents. Then you can actually define a graph structure over these documents by having a list index over your notion and Slack documents. The, the, the way this graph structure works is that when you actually query this top level graph, for instance, like, um, give me a summary of these, these two articles, or give me, for instance, like, uh, tell me about uh, uh, like risk factors, right? Within, uh, if these are kind of like financial statements and you ask like, hey, can you, um, or actually a better question is like, uh, tell me, give me a summary of this uh, customer A, right? Uh, uh, for your customer account. This will actually take the query, route it through this list and then feed it to each index. And then it would get an answer first from each index and then route it to the top level uh, list index. And then you can actually generate an answer. So let's actually just walk through an example. For instance, let's say the question is, you know, tell me the airports in Seattle, Houston, Toronto. Um, if, you know, one city is provided, give, just give me the airport information. Otherwise, like try to actually uh, uh, tell me a, a little bit about the airports for all cities. Let's assume that you have a separate index or, you know, Toronto, uh, C uh, Seattle, and, and Houston. I know this says Boston here, and, and that part can be fixed. Um, the idea here is that you would take in this top-level question. It would get routed to each individual uh, index, and you would generate an initial answer from each individual uh, index. And then you would generate that, take that response, and then um, take that response from each index and combine it at the top level through the list index. And then at the uh, very bottom, you see here, you know, the airports in Seattle, Houston, Toronto are, uh, and then you can actually get back uh, a final response that's actually able to synthesize over all the different data sources that you have. At a very high level, going back really quick, the idea of defining a graph structure is just to kind of define a slightly more complex view over your data so that you can perform slightly more complicated forms of retrieval 
to solve, uh, to, to answer certain types of questions. Another example uh, is just be, really being able to compare and contrast uh, more explicitly different types of uh, documents or, or uh, anything that you want, really. And so here, you know, um, an example here is, let's say you want to compare and contrast the sports environment of Houston and Boston. You take in this question, and let's say, you know, you compose a graph consisting of uh, a vector index for both Houston and also Boston. Those are separate indexes. And then you combine them with a list index at the top level. This query would get routed to each index on its own. And we can add something that we call like a query decomposition module, where we take in this more compl complicated question and we could convert it into a simpler one, like what sports teams are based in Houston, what sports teams are based in Boston, and then use that question to actually ask uh, or ask that question over each individual vector index. Similar as before, we get back a response. So get back the answer for the sports teams for both Houston and Boston. And then both answers would then get combined uh, through the list index, and then you get back a final answer. So again, defining this graph structure, plus like you know additional stuff like the, these query decomposition modules, allow you to run more complex qu uh, queries. For instance, like being able to compare you know certain x and uh, across like different types of documents. Uh, and it's a very powerful tool that allows you to ask kind of like more complex analytics queries beyond, uh, for instance, like simple semantic search. Another use case I want to highlight is just this idea of like multi-step queries, which evokes uh, this idea of like chain of thought prompting, if you're familiar with that. The idea is that you can break a complex query into multiple simpler ones over a data source. An example here is, for instance, a question, who is in the first batch of the accelerator program the author started? That's a slightly more complex question because it has multiple parts to it. Let's say you have access to a data source where you can answer questions about this given author. You could take this question, um, use the query decomposition module, which is powered by a language model, uh, to uh, you know infer a simpler question. What accelerator program did the author start? And then you could use that to generate back an initial response. You know, the author started this accelerator program called YC. Then you feed it back in, you know, um, or feed it back through the query decomposition module and ask, who is in the first batch of YC's accelerator program? Um, you know, feed it back in th through the data source index, get back an answer. You know, this first batch of YC's accelerator program started in 2005, included a bunch of different startups. And then keep on going until you feel like you've answered all questions that you can from this data source uh, given the question. So then you get back this final answer. And the key idea here is that if you have a more complex question, you can choose to break it down into simpler ones if you'd like until you're actually able to get back a satisfactory answer. Finally, just the last bits that I want to talk about is um, there's also questions that are very interesting that have a temporal nature to them. Um, one example question is what did the author do after his time at YC? So given such a question, if you just do basic semantic search, you're going to hit a node where it just only describes the author's time at YC, um, as opposed to really looking at, you know, before or after. So we have like a, a set of abstractions that allow you to continue feeding in additional context that could be relevant to the question, even after the basic retrieval process. Because the basic retrieval, for instance, if you do semantic search, is just going to take this embedding and then probably match it with the author's time during YC. And uh, a lot of times it will be helpful for you to feed in additional context in a temporal manner. For instance, look at future nodes or also look at previous nodes. And in this case, you wanna look at future nodes. Another use case here is this idea of recency filtering or outdated nodes. Um, uh, this is actually a feature that's been widely requested by users where imagine you have, for instance, like three timestamp versions of the same uh, like same data, and some of this data is outdated. Uh, and obviously, the most recent uh, version is going to be the most up to date. So then when you ask a question, you don't want to, for instance, like uh, confuse the language model with a bunch of outdated context. And so we have capabilities for you to do um, different types of recency filtering, whether it's like time waiting through some sort of like uh, mathematical formula, or you just explicitly sort by date, and then you can actually filter out older nodes. This allows you to get back a response that um, can basically prioritize more recent nodes first.
Sweet. And so that's basically it for the talk. I will share these slides uh, uh, in the in the in the chat uh, as well. And um, there's a, a different like there, there's other slides uh, here too that basically show you uh, different types of tutorials. For instance, like here you could integrate with a downstream application. Uh, for instance, you could build a chatbot with Llama Index plus Lang Chain as an outer agent abstraction. Uh, here's tutorials on how you can build a Streamlit app. There's a bunch of demo walkthroughs, especially with the new release that we did with 0.6.0 that allow you to customize retrieval query engines on top of your data, uh, and also uh, some cool router abstractions that we added to help you build this unified query interface. Cool. And so I think that's it for the presentation. And the next up is uh, I'll be uh, talking to Frank and well, answering some questions. So yeah, thank you for that presentation, Jerry. Um, great talk, by the way. And you know, we have a couple of questions, both from the audience as well as from myself. And I figured we could sort of have more of a, a bit of a conversation, uh, sort of like a conversation Q and A hybrid. Um, and we'll just talk more about Llama, talk more about the origin story. You know, where where you guys are going to be going in the future. You know, what some of the exciting features that you guys uh, have planned uh, coming up as well. Uh, and the first one is, you know, I think. We see, I think you sort of see, you know, two camps of people when it comes to LLMs, right? I think the first is folks who feel like there's going to be sort of continuously evolving models, models that are designed for very specific purposes, for example, Bloomberg GPT, you know, on financial yep. data. And then you have another camp who feel like, you know, the future is going to be a lot of just these very, very general purpose LLMs, very large models uh, designed to be all purpose, right? To be, to to essentially do anything that you really can or want to do with it. I imagine, you know, Lama Index is, is, is going to be useful for both of these paradigms and which, you know, if we do go for that first route, you know, models mm -hmm. that are more, that are smaller, but more targeted, do you see any differences in how you might potentially use Lama Index with these? Yeah, it's a good question. It kind of gets into the very first part of the presentation, which is about this idea of like fine tuning distillation, uh, right? Uh, for instance, you could imagine a world where everybody is just, does some machine learning process on top of uh, new data to basically train and distill all these like specialized models that can do different types of tasks. And that really gets into more classical machine learning, uh, which is uh, why a, a lot of current models these days uh, really are trained for specific tasks. Um, I think there will probably be a world where we start having more specialized models. Um, in fact, I think that world is probably good, uh, just that there's less of a monopoly from kind of like a single model provider. Um, and I think it also makes a lot of sense from like a systems perspective. And the reason for that is yeah. that um, these large models are amazing, but they uh, are, are by nature very big. And I'm sure, you know, class and scale and all these things will come down, but there's just like some sort of like probably fundamental information capacity of these networks such that like, you know, there, there's going to be some minimum size that some model needs to be to be uh, as powerful as it is, right? And so I think like just purely if almost for like cost and specialization purposes, especially for instance, if you want models to be able to run like on device or on prem, you're going to start seeing a bit more like distilled and specialized models. And so I think um, I'm very excited personally about that type of ecosystem. And then I think the next part here is that I could see Llama Index being used in both of these worlds, because even for these specialized models, you know, there's still a lot of these trade-offs I mentioned in the beginning about kind of being able to actually make sure that you're, you're incorporating the right knowledge in your data, right? Like you could choose to, for instance, fine tune on every bit of new information that comes in so that this model is, model is able to incorporate the knowledge, or you could fix the model itself and pair it with a retrieval model. And a lot of times that's way easier to think about with this idea of just like, you don't have to do a bunch of machine learning. You can just wire this as part of this overall like data pipeline or system, and then it'll still work for you out of the box. And then the, the last part I'll say is, I think going with this idea of like fine tuning distillation, one thing I'm very interested in is actually this idea of like uh, being able to fine tune a very good retrieval model. So for instance, like, uh, make this model way smaller, like take something like GPT-4 and just like strip out most of the knowledge capabilities. Like it doesn't need to know about Wikipedia. It doesn't need to know about other stuff, but you just keep the fact that it's very good at reasoning about new information that you feed it. And that part I'm very interested in because I'm wondering like what, like how small can that model really get, right? To to, to uh, still have those amazing reasoning capabilities because that would actually help a lot with something that we're building with Llama Index. Oh, yeah, 100%. And I think a big problem with a lot of existing, you know, these large language models or auto aggressive language models is the fact that, you know, you have it trained on this very, very large corpus of data. 
And because it's doing a lot of next token prediction, you know, if it immediately doesn't get that next token correct, uh, you end up having you end up having hallucination or you end up having the wrong answer, right? Um, if you can, in some way, shape, or form, really constrain the model to look at data very specifically from the prompt, I think that would definitely go a long way in terms of you know both what you're what you're working on with Wellman Index uh, as well as a variety of uh, sort of other applications as well. So yeah, great answer. I really appreciate that. We've got some questions from uh, you know the attendees as well from folks here and. The sure. first is uh, is probably more general. It's is Llama Index a retrieval model that is paired with an LLM? Yeah, so that's a good question. You could, um, it, it's it is that, but it is a bit more than that too. Um, so there's different layers to Llama Index. The very top level view of Llama Index is that um, Llama Index is just a black box around your data in LLM, and so you can query Llama Index the same same way that you would typically query a language model. And then um, similar to something like, for instance, like uh, TrackGPT or GPT-4, uh, you would get back a response. But because we manage the interactions between the language model and your data, you get back a response where it actually has context over your data. Now, under the hood, right, underneath that black box, there's both, there's a lot of things going on. Um, there's like retrieval over your data. And then there's kind of like synthesis, uh, being able to combine stuff into an answer. And then uh, this could be a one-step process where you do retrieval, then synthesis, then you're done. Or it could be a multi-step retrieval synthesis mm -hmm. process. For instance, if you define a graph over your data, or if you define like uh, some sort of, of the, the chain of thought prompting stuff that I just mentioned. And um, you could choose to use each of these models independently too. And so you could totally choose to use Llama Index as a retrieval model by itself if you also wanted to pair it with kind of your own LLM application logic. Yeah, yeah, great, great response there as well. Uh, sort of a great follow up for that. Uh, another, another one from Blackness as well is, you know, could you have the index be dynamically built for each query, or do you have to have it be manually predefined for every query? That's that's actually a great question. So I think this is something that we've been thinking about a lot. Um, right now, it the index is um, kind of user specified. So the user uh, has to define a set of indexes that they want. Um, so I guess to um, frame this a little bit better, it's kind of like you're the user, um, you develop these this LLM application, you define the set of indexes, which means I guess roughly a priori, you have a, some sense of like the types of questions that the, uh, you know, uh, that this uh, application might receive so that you want to kind of like almost prepare uh, for that with the set of indexes that you think would, would make sense. Now, one thing that we think is very powerful, though, is that, for instance, like different indexes are optimized for different use cases. Like if you have a vector index, it's better for semantic search. Like if you have a list index, it's better for kind of like um, a summarization. If you have like one of those fancy graphs that I just showed, it's better for like comparing and contrasting stuff. Um, one thing that we just kind of like recently introduced is the idea of like a better router abstraction where you can like uh, kind of like define some set of tools. Each tool is better for like certain types of queries and wrap all of those under some sort of router. Uh, and it's similar to this like agent tool paradigm where it basically what it does is it provides kind of like, uh, it unifies like all these tools under a single query interface. So you could take in like a query and then it would hit the router and then the router can actually pick the right tool for the job in an automatic fashion. Yeah instead of you as a user needing to kind of like anticipate, hey, this index should actually try to solve like all these different types of like uh, queries on my awesome. respond, you can focus on developing different types of like indexes and query configurations for different use cases, and then wrap that all under some sort of router abstraction. So that's something that we're super excited by. And I think this goes into just being able to kind of like anticipate the questions that you can ask in a more automatic fashion. Um, and then the next part that I actually haven't talked about is like now, um, how do you automate the indexing process too, right? This is kind of more, how do you automate the query engine process to, to route to the right index? But how, like, you know, in a production system, if you have a ton of data coming in, how do you just like automatically uh, figure out the best indexes over this data, both given your use case and given your system requirements? And that part we're still thinking about. Yeah, fair enough. When can we, maybe when can we expect this kind of, this router, this router abstraction to be, to be in LAMA index? Uh, so the router abstraction is already in Llama Index, actually. Um, okay. we've, we've had that for a while, and we just recently uh, kind of revamped that like uh, yesterday, basically. And so uh, if cool. you want, uh, here's a free plug for, for like the new blog post that we just put out. Um, and then for kind of like some of the more automatic indexing, though, well, I do think the routing abstraction is just one step. Um, I think there's a lot more steps that you can take to build a better automated interface to really handle different types of queries and execute that over your data. 
And so for instance, auto indexing during build time, uh, being able to like optimize stuff like token usage, all of these things were, were still continuously improving. Good stuff, good stuff. Uh, a follow-up to that is, you know, what is the best LLM for running locally and using LUM index? And there's probably, you know, I'll, I'll let you answer that first, but um, uh, sure. I can probably guess what your answer is going to be. Um, yeah, you yeah, know, well, ac actually, I haven't really like, um, I haven't actually done extensive testing on this. So, so actually, I don't even know if I'm, I'm like the best person to answer this. And so we'll love to hear your thoughts. I, these, like, I have played a little bit around with like, uh, kind of like, uh, like the alpaca stuff as well as like stable LM and then a little bit of like hugging face. I think they're all like, they're all decent, I guess. Um, I still think like OpenAI, like GPT is just better. Um, but I think, you know, uh, for a lot of like basic tasks that they, they can work. But honestly, like uh, I'm probably not the best person to answer. So I think I, I would actually love to get additional uh, feedback and insight from the community. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, you know, I think the a, a lot of different models, they all have their own sort of, you know, things that they're good at, I would say. And um, I don't think there's a very, very easy way to answer that, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I think a lot of it, I think, as you mentioned, sort of OpenAI is probably the, the gold standard for now, um, you know, GPT-4. Uh, but, you know, it can be, I think having having a full, you know, what I really, really love about Loma Next is, you know, having the capability of having potentially a full open source solution, a full stack open source solution from, you know, the, your, your, your indexing all the way to, you know, whatever LLM that you're using, right? And yep. uh, while there are a lot of open source LLMs out there today, um, each of them, I would say, is trained a little bit differently. They have, um, you know, they have things that they're good at. Things that they're not they're they're also not so good at, um, and definitely a bit of experimentation is uh, is required before 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 moving forward. But um, but I would say any you know any 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 model that is based off of Facebook's Llama model is probably a good place to start. Yeah, probably. Yeah, I, I've heard it's um, I have heard it's pretty good. I, I feel like these days every day I see some new open source version of some proprietary model coming out too, and so I wouldn't be surprised yeah. if there is some sort of convergence there. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, and then there's uh, you know you probably get this question a lot, which is um, you know, sort of one of the reasons I am sort of leaving it sort of a little bit more towards the end. But you know, could you compare Llama Nex and Langchain? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I think. The, uh, I mean, yeah, it's it's a it's a very popular question. Yeah. Uh, it's a it's a good one too. Um, so I think the way I would describe it is that we are pretty much like, I mean, if you just saw the presentation, we're we're very focused on like retrieval synthesis of your data. Like I think that pretty much is the main goal that we're focusing on, and we're focused on both that as like a set of building blocks, um, and then also kind of package packaging that into an overall system. That solves all the dimensions that we talked about. For instance, like the ease of use aspect to performance, like latency, costs, like all these different things. And so we are just like really thinking deeply about all of these abstractions that we want to take. And the goal is to just make it really easy for users to interact and query their data. And so but there are some overlaps with, with LangTrain, but I would say like LangTrain has a bit lighter abstractions around this area. Um, and, you know, we also make it really easy to integrate with your LangTrain app. Uh, so for like what Langtrain has is a bunch of like prompts, like evaluation, like agent abstractions, like some retrieval stuff, and then also kind of like, like being able to build chatbots and, you know, a lot of different, different things. And so we kind of see ourselves as like a really, really good data plugin, right. That you could just like use as part of some outer client abstraction, whether it's like an agent uh, from Langtrain or like chat GPT interface or anything else, really, um, even with stuff like auto GPT. So yeah. like. Llama index, uh, you know, we, especially as a core module, that's really what our CAC see ourselves going. And, and um, if you do use it, we like ideally would love to offer all the functionality that you would expect over your data. And you can actually easily plug it into your downstream application. Yeah. And I also want to add that, you know, in, in Jerry's slides, there's also a great one about uh, a demo that's actually using Llama index along with Langchain. So I think these two are actually very, you know, if we dive a little bit deeper into it, they're two very, very complementary projects. Um, yeah, but great, great question nonetheless. Uh, sort of piggybacking on our on our previous conversation about LLMs, uh, about which open source LLM to use. Is there any LLM uh, in in your eyes that performs close to GPT three point five? Um, and also, I guess as a follow up, is there anyone that has comparable GPT four? Oh yeah, I've I've um, 
Yeah, I think the main one is probably like um, like anthropic. I think that's uh, it seems to be a pretty common sentiment too. Um, I have played around with other models. Um, they seem decent, I guess. But I think that the main thing is um, for a lot of these models, it's kind of a question. There, there's like a few things you look for, right? It's just like one is um, how often does it hallucinate? Um, how often does it actually just like make, uh, or there's one, how often does it hallucinate too? Is how often does it like make the wrong decision? If you put it in some sort of like repeated reasoning chain, it just like actually just picks the wrong response. Um, and the three is, you know, what's the quality of the output? And so um, I've, I've kind of like stress tested a few of these models through both like the retrieval synthesis stuff. Like there's a few indexes within uh, the uh, Llama index that allow you to just like kind of do repeated uh, reasoning and, and uh, synthesis calls. And I think a lot of these models do get tripped up at some point in the middle. Like they, they're not able to fully reason over this information. They can like hallucinate wrong information. Uh, and I think GPT-3 um, uh, and especially GPT-4 uh, are just like very good at kind of like being able to output uh, good quality answers without too much prompt tuning. And I think that's something that's very powerful. Um, and I think that's also why, for instance, like GPT-4 is starting to be used in all this like auto GPT stuff, because you can kind of trust it to do some basic reasoning over this data and do it in a way that doesn't propagate a ton of errors through like repeated calls. And I think that's something that you can't really do with a lot of these LLMs so far. Yeah. And sort of just to add to that very, very briefly as well, you know, when it comes to GPT-3.5 and open source, I would say the only any, I'm not going to say any, any llama based model is going to be comparable to it but i think you can get pretty close um mm -hmm. and really i think the quality of open AI's training data is a little bit better than 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 that of a lot of open source models uh, when it comes to gpt4 uh you probably won't get any open source models that are close to it right now unfortunately probably about a generation behind but i think a lot of these open source models will continue to catch up um and there's there's a lot of sort of open work that's being done right now on that perspective mm -hmm. as well gpt4 you know if my if i had to guess probably has something like probably around a trillion parameters i don't know if you have any thoughts about that either jerry um, and also I think the reasoning capabilities come from, you know, it's not just a longer context length, it's also a deeper model as well, right? And I think mm -hmm. the depth is probably what really contributes to the improved reasoning capabilities of GPT-4, uh, not something that's available in the open source world, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, I think I am curious about just like, can you uh, get similar GPT-4 reasoning capabilities, but just make it um, in a much smaller package, right? And I think that's still an open question. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I've always been curious if you could, you know, add some recurrence on top of a smaller model, if that would give you, you know, at least some semblance mm -hmm. of improved reasoning capabilities. But anyway, that's a story for another day. Uh, what I'm going to why why when indexing PowerPoints or PDFs does the LLM understand the information a little bit differently? Uh, um. Oh yeah. So I think for indexing like different types of data. So the way um, uh, Llama Hub works, which is like our data ingestion piece uh, from different types of uh, data sources like PDFs, uh, PowerPoints, APIs, et cetera, we just convert whatever format it is into text. So if it's like, you know, text in the PowerPoint, it's text, right? If it's an image on the PowerPoint, we'll convert it to text through some like image captioning model or, or something. Uh, if it's like PDFs, we'll run OCR over the PDF or we'll do whatever it takes depending on the parser to convert it into text. So it's kind of like, um, there is a piece that, is, uh, that I haven't really discussed, which is just like the quality of the, you know, parsing from whatever format it is in the text. Like for instance, if your uh, uh, like text parser is just really bad, then it's just gonna be harder for the language model to index and understand stuff. Um, and so I think like when you're building this overall system, uh, the text parsing does is does matter. Uh, you do have to translate it into some text format, but I do think it's a lot easier than before because um gpt has a capability of just like understanding raw text without you having to like do too much processing over it as long as you clean it up in some like minimum way uh it tends to work already pretty well and that's why you have something like llama hub where you could just ingest stuff from like any different type of data source into a format that you can use great stuff yeah great i think stuff. um just uh double tracking i think there's like a question in the chat too uh which i think is different than the q a but i just want to make sure that we can talk about some of these Totally. If there's any one, I know we probably only have time for maybe about one or two more questions maybe in the final five minutes of, of, of this conversation. But if there's any, any, you know, a couple that you'd, that you'd like to answer in particular, we can go for those. Oh, for sure. I just want to double check on this because I think Arja asked, like, is custom synthesis over heterogeneous data scalable? And have you looked into scalability numbers uh, with like 
uh, Wanga index, right? And, and I think that's a good question because I think it's something I do want to talk about, um, which is the idea that like, it, I think scalability is definitely a challenge. Like I think um, anytime you have like chained LLM calls, it's just going to be a bit slower because you're repeatedly calling the language model with more data and it's just going to cost you more money. And so I think that uh, fundamentally is a challenge that, you know, we, we've been thinking about a decent amount. Um, that said, there are ways you can try to make this like kind of synthesis over heterogeneous data a bit easier to, to kind of reason about. One way to think about this is that um, one, we allow like an async API so you could like parallelize all these calls uh, across the different nodes. So you don't have to wait sequentially for like one node of your graph to like complete before like waiting for the next node. You can just like parallelize the calls there. The next part here is that I, the default we showed was defining like a list index over like a different vector indexes. That's really more for demo purposes. A list index, by the way, is not really scalable because again, just by virtue of being a list index, you're dumping all the data right uh, into uh, the language model. You're asking it to process all the, uh, the data. I think one way, another way you can kind of think about this is imagine you have some sort of like um, a vector index on top of other vector indexes then you could like first retrieve a subset of documents that are relevant to your top level query. And then within those documents, then like kind of look for a specific piece of information. So there's like different things you can do with a composable graph structure that can make some of the, these uh, like kind of lookups and, and synthesis and all these different things a little bit more scalable. So, yeah, good stuff. We probably only have time for one more question. I know there's a couple we actually have several more um so what what we'll try to do is we can we'll see if we can sort of get, get to get to the remainder of these questions offline but the final one um you know that 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 uh from again from the audience as well is that you know the query itself right so oftentimes when yep. you you know when you do a prompt or when you do a query the query itself oftentimes creates uh, you know it, it has a lot of knowledge embedded into that as well right so how do you find you know important you know, important aspects of queries or query frequency. And can you, you, can you better utilize, are there better ways to utilize the query um, in conjunction with whatever index or indices that you have in Llama index to give better or more sort of polished responses? That's a, it's a good question. Um, I think a lot of users have actually asked for this feature. Uh, we don't have like uh, explicit tutorials or demos for this yet, um, but it's something that I think is going to be really important because the idea is that, you know, you have a bunch of queries, uh, you want to kind of look up similar queries uh, in addition to just like looking up stuff from your knowledge corpus. It's almost like one way to think about this is like a, a memory, but kind of like a memory for your queries really, as opposed to just like a general like chatbot conversational memory. Um, I think a very basic uh, example that you could do is just like just create a separate vector index for for the uh, for like the right. the query right or, or for the set of queries and and responses and so then when you do look up like you could look up from your knowledge corpus um, uh, let's say that has like an index or graph structure defined over it and then you have an uh, index defined over your query information you could look up stuff in both sources and then figure out how to combine them now for deeper interactions between this like query uh, memory versus uh, plus your knowledge corpus index I think that's something that we'll probably investigate ourselves yeah. uh, so so I think that's a very interesting problem though and I think uh, we, we do want to think a bit deeper about the right architecture for this yeah, definitely. I would say that's probably a bit more of an open question as well. I'd love to sort of hear, um, mm -hmm. uh, look look to see, you know, as there's more research coming out in this area, what some of the interesting applications there are, what some of the interesting ways we're doing so. Um, sure. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think we're sort of at the top of the hour here. Um, and I'll sort of throw it back to, uh, you know, thank you for 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 going through this Q&A. Thank you for that awesome presentation as well, Jerry. Um, I'm going to throw it back to Emily uh and um you know to thanks sort of guys yeah yeah thank you jerry for the great presentation that was really wonderful and frank thank you so much for um hosting such a great q a session we do have a lot more questions so we're going to do our best to get some answers from jerry offline uh, we'll probably pull that into a, probably a blog roundup so we'll make sure to send that out to everybody um because we do want to get to those and we do need to let jerry get on to uh, the rest of his meetings today so we're going to let him out a little bit early um, thank you all for joining us. We really hope you enjoyed the session. You'll receive a link to the recording and some follow-up materials um, from us via email. So keep an eye out for that. And then we hope to catch you at the next Zillas webinar. You can check those out at zillas.com slash event. Thanks, everyone. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.